at the Alternative View 3 conference in Bristol in November 2009, we discussed the murder of Dr. David Kelly with MP and author Norman Baker, highlighting this very dark chapter in British history still being written. However, during that interview, we had company which specifically accessed the camera and disrupted the signal at a crucial point. That's Greg Dyke's sacking at the BBC. Well, this is an event which, which clearly stank. We have a situation where Lord Hutton's report, which was supposed to be investigating the death of David Kelly, did no such thing, was clearly hopeless in the matter it did investigate, namely the relationship between the BBC and the government, and was so biased towards the government that it was literally incredible. Uh, under those circumstances, I felt uncomfortable with uh, the Hutton inquiry. I wondered whether he was sound on David Kelly if he was so unsound on other matters. Uh, we then had leading medical experts querying uh, whether or not David Kelly could have died that way, and in fact saying it was clinically impossible for him to have done so uh, by letters to the paper. I then began to look into it. The more you look into it, uh, the more uncomfortable I became. Uh, every single stone I picked up was something really quite nasty crawling underneath it. The kind of people, the police level, the, the, the fact that the judge himself was chosen to make sure that things happened the way it should happen, that involved us an awful lot of things crawling on a lot, an awful lot of rocks. How do you plan to fight that, deal with it? Well, I mean, an interesting question is whether or not it's realistic to assume that a large number of people could have come together for a, for a deceitful purpose. And actually, if you look at it, you don't need to have that many people involved. You need to have a number of people who've got questions who are told to keep quiet. But a number of people who actually need to know what's going on. Uh, is relatively few in number, probably no more than five or six as a matter of fact. Who would those people be? Well, they would be, clearly, they would be uh, one or two in government, and it would clearly be one or two in the police. Um, others may have had their suspicions, but were quite clearly told to keep quiet. The, the Oxford coroner may have wondered, for example, why he was being bundled off the case. The pathologist may have wondered why his questions weren't pursued until he raised them. So how do you get around that yourself as an MP? Well, what sort of pressure could be brought upon yourself? I mean, you're, you're in a vulnerable position, surely. Well, I'm in a less vulnerable position than many. I mean, I'm a public name. Um, I've got access to the media. Uh, if I have allegations to make, I can get papers like the Daily Mail, Mail and Sunday to give them big coverage. That's a protection for me. I, I get coverage in the papers both because it's important the story is known, but also because it gives me a level of protection uh, from uh, those who may wish me ill. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's an, an attitude uh, and an approach which is not available to other people. Uh, ordinary individuals who aren't members of parliament may not have access to the press in the same way, may not have access to detailed documents in the same way, may not be able to ask ministers questions to which they get answers in the same way. So, you know, I'm in, in a sense, in, in that sense, in a privileged position, but those of us who are in a privileged position should use that for the public good, I think. So how is it that MI6, who are meant to defend us, internationally against foes from abroad. How is it that the, when it comes to this country, their information is basically torn up or misused in such a way? How, how can we get, how can they get away with that? Well, MI6, of course, is supposed to look after the relationships outside this country, and MI5 looks at uh, matters within the country. That's loosely how it has been, although there's obviously some some crossover. The evidence is the security services uh, did not share the uh, black and white Alistair Campbell view that Saddam Hussein was a, a major definitive threat on weapons of mass destruction. The evidence is that they had sources uh, who said that, one, one source in particular, who's referred to in my book, uh, they treated that with some scepticism and intelligence briefings are necessarily ifs and buts and, and perhapses and maybes. Um, they uh, had question marks and the government changed those question marks to exclamation marks and misused intelligence. So the abuse that we saw of information in 2003-2004 was not as a consequence, in my view, of the security services. It was a consequence of the politicians in Downing Street seeking to hike up, hype up for political purposes uh, briefings which were uncertain in their nature. But how is it that effectively unelected advisers can come into government or be invited into government and actually block the security services, that how is it that they basically stand with their, with their hands in their pockets and nothing seems to happen and we have a whole war going on, it's a disaster, many of our troops and services etc are, are suffering very badly, there's a great deal of anger amongst those involved, uh, yet we're all sort of, we're having to have a person like yourself help blow the whistle on this, so to speak. Well, I mean, the, the security services, the civil servants and others, are all answerable to the government of the day. That's a constitutional position. And it's not their job 
to destabilise governments. Indeed, it would be quite erroneous and dangerous if they were to do that. So they I have agree, to. But in essence, we have lemmings going over a cliff here. Well, I mean, they, could they have done more? Could there be more whistleblowing? Perhaps there was, but I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an open secret that members of MI6 were going around Fleet Street briefing the papers that um, the intelligence was being misused by the government. We know that was happening. So there's only so far they can go constitutionally. I think the issue is why it was that Parliament wasn't able to find out the facts and why Parliament was not able to hold the government and data account. And that's to do with the, the untrammeled power that we give Prime Ministers in this country and to do with the relative weak position of Parliament vis-à-vis -vis the executive. That's what needs to be sorted out. We talked earlier about the expenses. That's one of the other things that you've been involved with. Do you think that the expenses rather has been used to weed out good politicians who would be there uh, otherwise be able to cause trouble for the for governments of the day and so we, they are replaced with yes men? Well they may be replaced with yes men because that's how the party system operates to a large degree at least within the Conservative and Labour parties um, but no they've not been it's, it's not been they've not been highlighted in order to weed them out I mean they have left themselves vulnerable through inappropriate and in some cases illegal claims. I think that was a honey trap essentially? No, I think, I think that... They exploited the human nature of the... Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to excuse my colleagues for the way they behave. I'm really not. I mean, if you give somebody the opportunity... If, let's say you find a, a, a wallet lying on the ground. Do you keep the money or do you take it to the police station? There's a honey trap? No, you do the right thing. And, and, and if MPs are given the opportunity to claim for that which they shouldn't claim, it's not a defence to say, well, it's within the rules. That's a Nuremberg defence after 1945. And that went out the window at that point. It hasn't come back since. So every single MP has a moral code, like every other human being has a moral code. If people choose to behave in a way which is morally indefensible, whether it's in the rules or not, they will pay the price for that, and so they should. You've mentioned Nuremberg. Do you think that the politicians or the, or the individuals, the five individuals that you mentioned without name, would or should face such trials over this war in the future? In my view, uh, those who have deliberately misled Parliament who constructed a case for war based on nothing, who had an agenda to back a far-right US administration contrary to this country's interests, who've damaged the Foreign Office, who've upset the intelligence services, who've caused us and our reputation as Britain abroad to be severely impaired, who've caused the death of British soldiers and aided the death of hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians. Those people should be held responsible for that. Yes, they should. How do you propose that should be executed? Well, the, we now have a John Chilcott inquiry into the Iraq war, and one can only hope that John... Is that going to be any better than Hutton? I think it will be better than Hutton, um, if only because there's a passage of time and it makes it safer to be better than Hutton. The individual players now, by and large, are out of government, and therefore there will be less political pressure to protect them. So I think it will be better. But um, this is a very, very dark chapter in this country's history. It's a chapter that's still being written. It is a chapter that's still being written, and I'm still writing it in my own small way, as others are as well. John Chilcott has a duty to get to the bottom of it. Now, he's been appointed. Uh, this panel of his is, I think, four sirs and a baroness. We don't know whether that's going to be particularly representative of the country at large, but they are there. So let's wish them well, and let's hope they've got the courage to get to the bottom of things. So how are you calling for those individuals to be taken into custody and duly tried. I've made plain to Sir John Chilcott uh, my views on what happened in 2003. Uh, I've drawn attention to my book, he's got a copy of it as a matter of fact, uh, and I hope that he will then reach the relevant conclusions. He, his is a non-statutory inquiry, uh, and therefore he hasn't got a legal process by which he can, for example, impeach people. But I hope very much as a consequence of what I hope will be a rigorous inquiry, that will then lead to matters being considered of that nature. So, in essence, uh, in your book, it looked as if you were steering at the end towards certain people being responsible for um, David Kelly's death, but possibly at the end it was the Iraqis that did it or the Iranians that did it. Who do you think killed him? Well, I mean, I've, I've indicated in my book that I'm convinced beyond reasonable doubt, to use that quite high hurdle, that he was murdered. I don't say that lightly, uh, but that's the only conclusion which the facts will sustain. I've then indicated that I'm convinced on the balance of probabilities, to use a lower threshold, that he was murdered by Iraqis. Uh, I'm less convinced as to who commissioned it, whether it was Iraqis themselves or whether it was somebody else. But I've always said throughout, I am not a one-person legal process. It's not my job 
on my responsibility to set myself up as that basis and reach a legal judgment. What I can say is here is the evidence, the official conclusion of this farcical process called a Hutton inquiry is unsafe and the only way we can dealt with it is a proper legal process through a coroner's inquest. That's what should happen now. Do you think Hutton should face charges or should be disbarred? I think his reputation has been shredded and that's probably uh, sufficient for someone of that nature. And what about the BBC? The BBC seemed to have been attacked and novel, so to speak, on this whole inquiry, this whole thing that happened at that time. The BBC behaved, in my view, up to the death of Kelly in a perfectly proper way. They come under immense pressure, inappropriate pressure from Alistair Campbell and Tony Blair, Alistair Campbell in particular, who seemed to have a, 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 some sort of unhinged vendetta against them. But they stayed firm until such time as the Hutton report came out. When, of course, what we saw at that point was uh, the Hutton report was so biased that it forced the resignations of Greg Dyke and Gavin Davis, Deputy Director General and the Chairman. And of course, Alistair Andrew Gallagher lost his job as well. And what damaged the BBC was the Hutton report, the failure of the governors, crucially, to support the Director General. They should have stood up for Greg Dyke, and he didn't. And then the appalling, vomit inducing apology given by Richard Ryder on behalf of the governors to the government, which had more damaged the BBC reputation in three sentences that has happened since Reith was there in the 1920s. What do you think is the future with the media, with the newspapers, with the BBC? They seem to be the only way that we can get things out, yet if they're well, nobbled, well, the BBC, we, we won't know whether the BBC is recovered until there's another situation where it requires them to take on the government of the day and we see their metal or otherwise. We need to have uh, plurality in the media ownership, which we haven't got. There's far too much power in the hands of the Barker Brothers or Rupert Murdoch or people like that. We need more diversity in the media. We need to reform the libel laws so people are free to print rather more than they can in this country. This country is the worst in terms of libel. We stopped proper stories being printed. We, there's a whole lot of stuff we need to do uh, to try and make sure our media is stronger. The media may be uh, irritating and faulty on occasions, but they are very necessary for a democratic society. People should be courageous. They should, they should examine facts, and if the facts lead them in a particular direction, they should have the guts to say so. They should not be intimidated by um, the zeitgeist. And if they see an elephant in the room, they should say there's an elephant in the room. Thank you very much. However, during that interview, we had company which specifically accessed the camera and disrupted the signal at a crucial point. That's Greg Dyke's sacking at the BBC. As this has happened many times before, we highlight three examples to show that third-party non-visible action is tracking us and is destroying the video signal at vital, crucial points in the recording. Of the many examples, we have three, and since one involves Norman Baker, we start with him. The Norman Baker interview was specifically targeted at the point when Greg Dyke was resigned from the BBC. As well. And what damaged the BBC was the Hutton report, the failure of the governors, crucially, to support the Director General. They should have stood up for Greg Dyke. Well, the BBC, the BBC has recovered until there's another situation. We had to continue the interview with an analog recovery from the original have, digital uh, corruption. Plurality in the media ownership, which we haven't got. So That's my number two. There's no doubt. Example that. two. Former chief Hello, medical officer for Finland, Dr. Rauni yeah, Kilda, who was a specialist in mind control country, and population and control systems, was just about to discuss a vital Earth. meeting with two top-level U.S. military Earth. officers at a special no, UFO conference in Moscow, it, which had Russia's leading cosmonaut speaking on alien activity in the Soviet maybe Union. Mm -mm. So maybe an ad to them. Before or Russia, uh, the mm. Russian Republic, as it is now, have you had any further contacts with Russia since no. then? Uh, no, any... that was, no, that was no. it. No. That this was... entire 20 minute block was destroyed in the camera's hard drive as we shot it. Example three, Maria Thorne, a Brazilian interviewed in the United States, was showing her personal photographs to me with many US astronauts when Buzz Aldrin was mentioned, and suddenly severe video interruption occurred. She was also just about to discuss Hitler's survival after World War II and the Nazi involvement with non-humans, or some would say aliens, to specifically create transhumans in the 21st century made with alien DNA, something we discussed at length in Bases 1 and Bases 2, Take 2.
We continue with Maria on sound only. Who told you this again? So the a lot of the the Germans culture has told us that essentially the Germans were given the Germans gave away the atom bomb secrets to the Russians and the Americans and kept this extraterrestrial a secret and brought it to Venezuela. Is that correct, or what, did it come to Brazil as well? I don't know. They mentioned Brazil too, but I don't know anything about Brazil. You know, this is not my area in reality. Yeah. You know, but. The things that I know were told to me, were passed to me by this friend. You know, he was from CIA. So he certainly knew a lot of things, and he is a very—he was a very reliable person. He would not create. He would not invent something just to please me. You know. So these extraterrestrials came to the Germans and they were giving the Germans some help with technology. All kinds of very advanced technology, very advanced physics, because their physics is much more advanced than ours, for sure. If they can come here, if they, if they can make deals, this means they are much more advanced. They are superior. And the idea is to generate a new, a new race of beings here on Earth. Yes, create a new race, hybrid races, you know, thing like that. You know. That was I was told. Did they give any details about what kind of race these people would be? No, he just mentioned that something about um, um, a change with the DNA strands. He mentioned that something about DNA too, you know. So they are going to change the DNA, but I don't know how. I don't know how. I cannot explain to you. But he mentioned it. My friend mentioned it, or something about DNA strands, you know, change. And, and when was this? When when you were told this? I was told this in 1995. Wow. 13 years ago, or 14 years yeah, ago. Yeah. Yes. And did how did you feel when this was? Spoken. I felt he was very serious. He was very sincere, yeah. very precise, you know. Excellent. I could feel this, you know. And oh, your intuition is that what he was saying was true? Yes, I had that intuition. But I don't know, as to myself, I don't know anything about this. What I know are things that have been told, have been told to me by people like him.